Welcome everybody back here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center um, at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's uh, 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 another day on planet Earth. Uh, we have uh, a wild weather here. It's uh, uh, 1500 flights have been canceled, flood warnings, people drowned uh, even in the in the Hudson Valley if we understand right. And uh, it's a big a chaos, but in the midst that a big storm, there are always things that help us to focus and to look forward to the future. And I think theater art is a part of it. And we have today, I think, an important conversation on HowlRound. And we would like to thank HowlRound for hosting us. Um, we have with us uh, today um, Hali, Hali and Marcus from the University um, of Hawaii. Um, they are here uh, with us from the theater uh, program. And um, it's uh, a great uh, honor to have them uh, with us here. And um, we're gonna talk about new initiatives that come from that campus that for a very long time before it became fashionable, before people realized the real importance of where indigenous studies have been taken serious, were fostered, supported, um, and, um, and um, also uh, created. So um, it is the University of Hawaii at uh, Manoa, uh, but both of them in the heart are theater people. So, um, Haili, maybe we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit, who are you? Where are you coming from? And uh, how come you ended up at that theater program? Belina Meke Aloha in Ahoa, a launapu ana make ia, viki o hoi, he zui, mahalo ya Howlround, mahalo ya Frank, mahalo ya Marcus. Um, yeah, aloha mai no kako, mai Hawaii, a hiki loako i kahi o Frank, ma Europa, a peia pu me Marcus ma America, ma New York na hoi. E ya no vau, he vahi kaika mahine, mai kawai, mai kapaa hoi, a e ya no ke noho nei ma kahalu'u o ahu nui alua i ke ya manawa. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to join and share about our program and share about our, our work as creatives and academics living here in Hawaii. Um, I hail from the island of Kauai, and uh, I'm currently now located in Kahalu'u, which on, is on the island of Oahu, nearby the ancestral lands of my mother, my grandmother, and many generations before that, um, he'e yakea. Um, so thank you, uh, Frank, for this invitation and opportunity to share about our work. Um, and mahalo ya oi, Marcus, um, for uh, pulling me into this uh, opportunity and this conversation. Uh, so I am a Kanaka Maoli theater artist. Um, <clears throat> Forgive the voice. It's about six something here in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, Very I tried early, to yeah. try to get up and move around and move the voice a little bit, but it's just a little bit uh, rusty, I think. Uh, so I'm currently the director of the Hawaiian theater program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, I did get my start in former theater training on the island of Kauai, where I'm from at the Kauai Performing Arts Center, uh, and then moved on to the university for schooling. Well, tell us a bit, what is this theater training? What did you do and how did you get inspired to do theater? Yeah, so when I was a freshman in high school, uh, there was an initiative throughout the state of Hawaii across the island chain. Um, and the first two uh, programs to open up, it was for high school students, formal training in um, Euro-American theater. We did musicals and plays. Uh, and this, the first center uh, on Oahu was at Kaimuki this, and the first center on Kauai um, was a tri-school performing arts center. So we have three high schools on the island, Kapa'a, Kauai and Waimea High School. And there were auditions and they put, they pulled together about 20 of us from across the island. And we had programming every day after school and would work towards production. And so I think that was my um, entry point into uh, Western theater. 
Euro American theater. Uh, prior to that, I was a hula dancer uh, and was raised culturally um, in different styles of uh, performance, uh, storytelling and, and hula. Uh, and then went on into this kind of training and that found me uh, at a junior and high school at a statewide program called the Summer Program for the Enhancement of Basic Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, that was uh, something that made me think Hawaii might be a place I might stay. Prior to that, I had my eyes set on moving to America and I guess joining the many hopefuls in New York <laughs> um, and, and you know, attempting to make a career there of, uh, as a performing artist. Um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, though, opened my eyes to another area, another discipline that would really pull me back into reconnecting with my culture uh, and my ancestors. And that was the Hawaiian language program. So as a freshman, uh, through, yeah, I should mention the college opportunities program, which made college possible for me as well. Uh, it's a program for minority retention students that would not otherwise make it into UH Manoa. Uh, and completing that program, there was a provisional acceptance into Manoa. And after the first year of being a successful student, you received your official letter um, of acceptance to Manoa. So as a freshman, sorry, there's a lot of backstory here. As a freshman, I um, was taking theater because I already knew I wanted to do theater and had had that previous summer at Kennedy Theater where we took classes and we put three productions on. Uh, so I, I felt like that could be a home for further learning and development of the craft. And then I started taking Hawaiian language and things just started to open up. Um, and a language I had heard in my youth um, from my great aunt and in my community, in my church, uh, those things started to come back to me. And I started to realize how important it was for me to become a fluent speaker and how learning the language had started to unlock understanding. And it started to kind of help me understand the past, understand the choices my grandparents had made, um, as well as the conditions uh, that my parents uh, were living in. You know, the, the Hawaii um, of military occupation, the Hawaii of displacement, um, the Hawaii of settler colonialism. And all of these, these learnings in language, I think, helped to inform me of the importance of my culture and my language and the severance that there was from, from my grandparents' generation with language and how that was so much linked to who they were as a people. And processing that, you know, I felt a turning point around the fourth year that I was in college. And it took me about six years to get my bachelor's degrees. Uh, but there was a turning point because prior to me really getting into language, there was a sense of assimilation. You know, I really wanted to be the Euro-American uh, theater practitioner. I really wanted to, you know, be performing in all these plays that really weren't of my culture. And then it was my senior year that um, I went after doing a senior thesis. 
And that senior thesis kind of propelled me into playwriting and, and writing a, a play in Olelo Hawaii in the Hawaiian language. I wanted to direct something. So this is a long story. I wanted to direct something in Olelo Hawaii to have something in the space at Kennedy Theater that would represent Hawaii, would represent the deep history um, that I was starting to understand that I came from um, and putting those pieces together. Prior to that, there was really nothing happening in the space, happening in the department that represented who I was, the place I came from, and the place I was studying in. Um, I was home, but everything was foreign. I appreciated the learning. I appreciated the exposure to the many types of Asian theater, as well as the, the Euro-American theater I was learning. But nowhere did I find a space that was represented a representative of me. And so, um, you know, writing and directing and producing Kalui Ko'olo, Ke Ka e a e a Ona Pali in 1995 was a way um, that I think my ancestors set me on that path. I had not anticipated what was going to come after that. I just knew that we needed to do this. We needed to tell our stories. Um, put our mo'olelo on stage. And, and the group that was involved in that, my, um, my friends at that time, we were all Hawaiian language learners. We were conversational, working towards fluency. And the theater then, Hanakiaka then, was a means for us to live in the language. It was a means for us to further our fluency and our acquisition of the language. And living in these mo'olelo um, gave us uh, something to kind of bring us together in community and kind of um, galvanized our desire um, to make some shifts and changes in Hawaii mm -hmm. and in the representation of who we are on stage. And so that's my personal story. What was the play about what you wrote? Your first play that was such a yeah. change in your life. So that that play was a story of Kalui Ko'olau. Ko'olau, uh, who many had listed as the Hawaiian outlaw. Uh, he was, um, for us, a hero. In uh, 1892, uh, he, and we should have probably have given a, a brief history of Hawaii. I'll try to do it in this story. So Kalui Ko'olau, he was a paniolo. He was a, a cowboy. He was um, also a sharpshooter, um, a, a ranch hand, if you will, um, on the island of Kauai. It's a story that I grew up with, um, a story that one of my uh, early kumu or teachers um, was a part of a band that did a song called the Nepali Outlaw. And so this song is something that I grew up with. And then when I was taking Hawaiian language fourth year, we had read this story. And it was um, the story of Kalui Ko'olau's life penned by his wife, Pi'ilani. And so his story, he's one of the many um, Kanaka Maoli who were inflicted with um, Hansen's disease or leprosy. And what happened um, around the time of the overthrow is that the provisional government, the illegal provisional government tried to separate the Kanaka with leprosy from the rest of the community. And Ko'olau was one of those that they wanted to ship off to the island of Molokai. 
And many will know of Father Damien's story and Kalau Papa in that settlement um, and them trying to treat um, those inflicted with what we called ma'ipake. Um, in um, Ko'olau's journey, he refuses to be separated from his wife and child and family. And then he flees with his family to Kalalau. Uh, the provisional government go after him um, and try to assassinate him for being sick and um, not complying to the provisional government's rule in 1892, which is months before the overthrow. Um, this happens in the fall of 1892 and January 1893, the provisional government overthrows our kingdom. Um, so Ko'olau, um, you know, states when he, when they try to get him, he states, you know, my wife and I took this bond that you introduced to us with your religion. And it stated, you know, in this um, holy matrimony that we will not be separated. Yeah, it's until death do us part. And here you are trying to separate us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to live out my life. And so for many of us, he is one of the early um, resistors, right? Uh, one of the early heroes um, who uh, eventually succumbs to the disease with his son as well. And his wife buries um, Ko'olo and her son. Um, and when she returns to Kekaha Kauai, um, she's arrested for harboring a fugitive. Uh, eventually, uh, she is released, and that's when uh, Kahikina Sheldon from the one of the newspapers comes over to Kauai and has her pen her story. And this lives on in our um, huge repository of Hawaiian language newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, so that story. Great. Great. And just yeah. very briefly, what was the story, the Western story, when you went to the theater program in your high school, you said, I was interested. What was that story where you were in or what play? So while I was in um, the the university. Or well, whenever program, your first Western, but as you said. It, oh, my movie. first Western um, play. Uh, we did uh, Carol Burnett sketches. It's Carol Burnett sketches. Yeah, just, you know, it, incredible to think. Uh, of the difference uh, yeah. of contest and context. Fantastic. Listen, uh, thank you so much, um, Haile, for, for sharing. Let's go to Marcus. Um, Marcus, you are a professor. You're actually the chair of the department um, of the um, uh, university, um, and you are uh, 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 the um, Overlook History Curriculum Theater Productions Research and um, Department of Theater and Dance. So uh, tell us a little bit about that uh, university and the, the very special place it is. So, so let me just kind of say, so my, my CV really kind of in a nutshell, so from Germany originally, Frank and I are both alums of the Institute for Applied Theater Studies at the University of Gießen in Germany. I was a student there from 1986 to 1991, then an assistant professor at that same institute uh, until 1997 for one year postdoc at the University of, University of Queensland in uh, Brisbane, where I was really for the first time introduced uh, to post-colonial studies. I was then an adjunct at various theater departments in New York City until 2001 and have been a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa since 2001. And I would say, you know, and I've been the chair um, for the last four years, and I really would, would say that our department is a very unusual department, uh, probably one of the few departments really in North America that uh, has that, that that is really kind of known for its uh, non-Western focus. So really since the 1960s, our department 
uh, basically um, has established a, a reputation not just for um, Asian theater re research, but also more or less kind of annual um, fully produced Asian theater productions, mostly from Japan, China, uh, Indonesia, Jingzhu, Beijing Opera, Kabuki, No Kyogen, Rundai, Wayang, Listrik, Wayang Kulit. Um, but, but, when, so, but when I came in in 2001, um, what kind of struck me at that time was that the entire faculty was white, which actually wasn't necessarily the case for other departments at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and even though, of course, we had this reputation for, for doing, you know, for producing particularly, you know, Asian uh, plays, and of course, our dance program also uh, offers and it always offered a broad range of dance traditions also from, you know, Oceania. Um, it's really only since the professorship for Hana Kiaka was kind of created uh, actually uh, in, in the fall 2012 um, that we saw kind of a major change. I mean, it was the first time that basically our department really served uh, the, the host culture and community. Um, and also since 2012, our department, uh, our faculty has become more diverse. Uh, now, in 2023, a third of our faculty are actually uh, people of color. So, and that's really only uh, something that started with Haile's hire in fall of 2012. So there's been kind of yeah. a major, major shift, uh, particularly to, to embrace the notion, as it's called here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, of becoming a, uh, a, you know, a place of native Hawaiian learning. And, yeah. and our Hanakiaka program is kind of a key uh, aspect of, of this kind of strategic tell, mission. Tell me a little bit. I know you were you were Richard Foreman researcher. I know you close to work of Hannah Miller. You are the, actually even now since five years the editor of the Brecht Yearbook, a very significant um, um, undertaking. Actually, how did you get exposed uh, to um, you know what was indigenous theater, post colonial theater? How does how did that enter? Uh, your your focus and um, I think that yeah, I think that's a really good question that all um, that happened really kind of very gradually. I remember in the mid nineteen nineties when I was still an assistant prof professor at Gießen, we brought in a production from Australia by by playwright and director Norman Price, and he kind of presented a play that he had written himself. And it featured an Australian Aboriginal actress in that in that production, and that was probably the first kind of indigenous, semi-indigenous, because it was still scripted by 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 a white Australian guy. That was kind of the, the, the my, my first encounter, basically, with uh, you know indigenous um, performance traditions. Um, I was a when I was a postdoc at the University of Queensland. I, uh, at the English department, which which was also their kind of theater program in many ways, uh, my I didn't actually know that they were kind of a pioneering department with regard to performance, uh, with regard to postcolonial studies. Um, but I learned a lot during that uh, during that one year about this approach. I was also involved in a. Um, devising devised theater workshop. Uh, of a production by the Brisbane-based Aboriginal theater company Koemba Jidara. Um, and this, this device piece ex ex exclusively featured an Aboriginal cast, uh, artistic director, um, associate uh, playwright, but it also involved two, two white dramaturgy assistants, uh, including myself, um, at the beginning of that process, and and I remember um, still very strongly my surprise when one of the major rules that was established in rehearsals was that the two white participants could only contribute to the discussion once everyone else in the cast had basically had their say. And um, at that at that point in in 1997 1998, this was you know quite baffling to me. Um, because I really didn't understand the cultural context 
um, at all at that point. I've only, you know, I mean, I've only come to appreciate this this notion kind of much much later. Actually, after moving to Hawaii, uh, what was also interesting when I, when when I was involved with the, with the Square by Jidara production was there was this extreme skepticism towards me as someone as a white academic who might write about their work to uh, to establish my career as an academic and predominantly kind of white academia so i actually didn't i didn't really go they didn't actually write about this this uh, ex experience so you could have written but you didn't yeah i didn't no i didn't um and then you went to hawaii how how did you encounter it then i think you went in and and you teach i don't know you were hired to teach uh, a, a theater a history i guess so how did that work so when i came in um so one of the courses i inherited was uh, theater 101 introduction to world drama and theater and i inherited a syllabus that had been taught by my predecessor um and i really didn't have much time to actually prepare this class i tried to make the most of what had been handed to me and uh, one of the um, sort of by one of the, the 50 minute lectures was on Hawaii, on, on hula and Hawaiian theater. And I had, so I had the syllabus, I had the lecture guide, I had, you know, video clips that had been handed to me. Um, and I literally had just been in Hawaii for six or seven weeks when I gave this lecture. Um, this was in our 600 seat theater, main stage Kennedy theater, 140 students, seven teaching assistants. And 10 minutes into my lecture, a, a, an angry student gets up from the last row of the theater and starts approaching me, who was, you know, center stage um, quite aggressively, um, yelling at me, you know, kind of implying that this was kind of an imperialist kind of takeover of, uh, of Hawaiian culture. The TAs uh, who knew that I was not familiar with the situation formed this kind of security <laughs> protective cordon around me. Um, and, and, and so it turned out that the, the student was um, a, a quite well known, I would say, kind of Hawaiian activist within the student community at, 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 at that point. Um, so, and again, this was kind of an interesting learning experience um, because it really, of course, shouldn't have given that lecture just, you know, after arriving in Hawaii only six weeks earlier, kind of inheriting this kind of course material. Um, so I and the, the 70 A's then had to go through kind of sensitivity training and for a while, I really, you know, my I was more of the opinion, you know, I, I, I'm not going to touch Hawaiian issues or cultures with a 10 foot pole. But this kind of changed um, because highly then uh, mm -hmm. gave these 50 minute introductions to Hawaiian theater regularly. Um, our daughter actually joined a halau, so a, a um, hula school, you might perhaps kind of translate it that way. And, and participated in that, that for kind of five or six years. And it's basically because of that kind of connection and also kind of seeing, see, seeing actually Heidi Opo's work that she also kind of talked about, mm -hmm. like the production that she kind of introduced earlier, uh, made me kind of reassess, um, you know, the, the, the situation. And of, of course, um, my, I always felt that Hawaiian people were seriously screwed mm -hmm. by, you know, American business interests, um, you know, yeah. political maneuverings. Um, and I organized, so in 2010, I organized an international Brecht conference, Brecht in Asia at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And, and Heidi Pua gave this really excellent a uh, welcoming speech from a Hawaiian sovereignty perspective and the um, kumu of um, our daughter's um, uh, halau actually performed a welcoming um, hula. And, mm -hmm. and so, so, if, so that's where perhaps also my, sure. my political so interest do in some of Yeah. That activist who kind of gave you a wake up call, you took it serious and that training, did that work? Or, or did it offend you? How did it, because you know this is a big question. How do we? I mean, I realized, change? of course, that this was you know was actually really a, a stupid thing to do. Um, 
uh, the sensitivity training was kind of ridiculous because there was only one office to to deal with harassment that was the sexual harassment office so the sensitivity training was related to that not really mm -hmm. to, to, to you know so not even an importance on it. But how did it change and how come you go from uh, a European professor, highly rated, comes and gives a lecture within two weeks as a specialist to having a third uh, a faculty um, uh, of color or, of, or native? I don't know exactly um, um, what the composition is, but how did that change happen? That's astonishing. So we had this really... Um this really interesting kind of visionary chancellor uh, in, you know, around 2009, 2000, no, I mean, you know, kind of a decade ago. And for one year, she pooled all vacant professorships, uh, vacant because of recent retirements, and asked departments to, to apply for, the, for these positions with a special focus either on sustainability or Hawaiian related. And that's basically when um, I, I was actually the person to write the proposal for um, for this Hana Keaka position, and it was approved. It was actually one of of, of several um, culture changing new professorships at our campus. Um, and I really have to say, uh, you know, uh, Heidi has kind of talked about her work, but but what's really incredible is that she. She only came in as an assistant professor of Hanakiaka in fall 2012. And in May last year, the Kennedy Center in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. already awarded her the Medallion of Excellence for having built this, this really impressive um, Hawaiian theater program, uh, not, you know, which, which has been so fundamentally important for our community and particularly uh, you know, particularly particularly of course the uh, hawaiian uh community but i mean that yeah. that's that, that's the other thing the, the the when 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 heidi produced the first her first major main stage production called the in 2015 um there was an interesting discussion uh, <laughs> among the theater faculty um because everyone worried that a production exclusively in Olelo, Hawaii, in the Hawaiian language without English supertitles would not fill the house. And, and Heidi really kind of put her foot down to just say, but Hawaii is an official language of the state of Hawaii. Why would there have to be English supertitles? There was a synopsis in the program, but the idea was basically <clears throat> that this, the, the focus was really on, on the Hawaiian language. And this was one of our most sold out performances and performance runs that I ever remember. Uh, I don't know, two and a half hour to three hour production followed by a, a curtain call that often lasted for, for 70 to, to 90 minutes because you had different halaos in the audience wow. that would kind 90, of stand nine, up. Nine zero? Yes. An hour yes. and a half? Yes. Oh, incredible. They, you know, so you would have different halaos in the audience that would kind of, you know, stand up, uh, start to chant. Uh, people in the audience on stage that they were familiar with some of the chants would kind of join in. Everyone in the halal would take would take a seat again. Another halal would kind of get up, and and this wow. was really kind of the inauguration, so to speak, of of our theater, which you can see, you know, behind me on the photo, uh, Kennedy Theater, really kind of for the first time, um, putting on a production that really first and foremost served served the wine community, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fifty years into its existence. So a, a change, actually, we all are looking for a change that was so strongly demanded also when it came here to the, the, the mainland, to Black Lives Matter, we see you, white theater. That change actually has been demanded by activists at your university. Change was implemented uh, actually as an affirmative ac action, pooling all uh, open uh, positions and say they have to be done by native indigenous. So it's, it's a radical thing to do, but it worked and it produced something amazing. Let's go back to um, Amha'ili. Tell us a little bit uh, uh, about the program there you created about that theater program. This is astonishing, of course, all to hear this. We, our audience should need, know. They're really great productions, uh, significant big productions. Also money is poured into it. It's not 
um, is tiny resources, often as it is at Columbia University or at NYU, where I have seen uh, also works with students as a, at a different level. But um, tell us a little bit about the work you got the um, Kennedy Center uh, Medal of Excellence for and congratulations for that. It's well deserved and so rare, but um, really uh, all our respect. But tell a little bit about, about that program. Mahalo, Anui. Yeah, I will um, kind of jump through uh, a couple of um, milestones, maybe, in our timeline as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, in 2012, I was hired. 2014, uh, the MFA track in Hawaiian theater was approved. 2015, La'i Kavai happened. And then in 2016, um, I organized a Ahahana Kiaka or a Hawaiian theater symposium. That was the way that I felt we could have community voices represented and for us to think strategically about where we might want to see this program go. Um, that was followed by 2017, our first Hawaiian theater MFA thesis. Um, and Nakawa Hiiaka, directed and written by Kaui Kaina. Thesis means uh, it's on stage, a performance is accepted as a thesis. Yes, yes. So it was the first um, original um, material and production um, that was produced in partial fulfillment of the MFA degree. Um, we were under construction. Kennedy was under construction that year. So her production actually happened um, on the north shore of the island uh, at um, BYU Hawaii campus. They were very kind to offer their auditorium to us. And that um, uh, eventually had a remount and a tour. Uh, to the island of Hawaii, as well as um, a remount at Chaminade University. La Kawai, I should mention, uh, we did a island-wide tour. So we did perform across the archipelago, and that also toured um, to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so around this time, uh, I just might mention that uh, there was a lot of, you know, questioning, skepticism, and I kept getting the question of what is Hawaiian theater? What is Hanakiaka? And I felt the need to educate everyone that I was around and an opportunity presented itself for me to go back to school. And so um, shortly after putting in my paperwork for tenure and promotion, I applied to um, a PhD program uh, at the University of Waikato in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and went ahead and pursued that um, while teaching. I, I did receive a sabbatical, and that allowed me to finish um, the doctoral study and my um, doctoral thesis as well. Uh, and finally graduated in 2019. And um, so over that three-year period, uh, I mentored and graduated a student, uh, as well as worked on some other independent projects. And then in 2019, um, Aua Ia Holding On, that particular production um, was in a way, a result of me going back to school, it had me kind of remembering what it was like to learn Hawaiian language and what it was like um, learning and digesting our history and, and strengthening a foundation of understanding um, through Hawaiian language. That particular production was the second um, major production of our our theater and our program featured on the Kennedy main stage. This was also very well attended and um, similar to La Ie Kawai, 
There was this engagement with the audience. The audience really shared their appreciation after each um, performance. And we were also invited um, to tour this production uh, to New York for the Reflections of Native Voices, um, that inaugural um, festival with La Mama Theater, Safe Harbors, and New York Theater Workshop. This might be a time to play that trailer if we want to see the tra trailer. That sounds good. Oh, sure. Let, let me see. Oh, let me oh, see again, if I can share. And, and I, I'll talk Let's a little see. bit yeah. more about you where can also we talk over it, that. you know, if you have comments uh, to it. Um, let's see if it works. Perfect. So I might I, add you, that. You directed that. I wrote and directed this. You wrote yes. and directed it. Yeah. And, and very I might briefly, add what is it about? Very briefly. The trailer is going to share exactly what it's about. Okay, so yes. start any time, Marcus. Yes. And as he's pressing play, I'll just say that this year we, we also hired our first graduate assistant for the Hawaiian Theater Program. And that allowed for um, so much more to uh, materialize for the program, a newsletter, um, our website, and a lot more community outreach. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have to interrupt. You did. Do you see the video, or you don't? No, it's um, not. We oh. see uh, just the window, but no video. I think you still have to play. Let's pray. The little triangle is still there. Because could you make me the host just for this one? Uh, let me see <laughs> if I could. And I can fill. Oh, here, oh it here, is. here it is. Here it is. If you just rewind. Okay. You can see it now. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, okay. yes. And we can hear it. Awesome. I truly believe that the reason why we do the work we do is so that we remember the stories of our ancestors and in doing so we move ourselves forward and we get we gain a greater understanding of who we are as a people so this particular story deals with four students who are enrolled here at the university of hawaii at manoa they engage with history they engage with the newspapers they engage in archival materials and in immersing themselves in the language and in the culture, they're able to kind of unlock knowledge and unlock understanding of texts. And in, in that understanding process, uh, they each go on a journey. And these particular journeys that happen take them to different times in our history. And those different times in our history are times where there is a shift in mana, a shift in a societal shift, where life is different for Kanaka Maoli. The entire journey as we follow the students is really about them coming to an understanding of what does it mean to be Kanaka Maoli in 2019. Taking part in this production is an honor because I get to experience not only the character as I would in a regular production, but the breath of our ancestors who are embedded in the production, who we are characterizing, who, are we, are, who we are portraying to the audience, to the university, and really to the whole world. We're really fortunate nowadays to have brilliant Kanaka minds who are thinking very rooted in our culture and looking very far forward. And with looking forward, they're keeping a very firm root in the past. I personally don't feel I was completely in control of this message as the script was being authored. I was following guidance and inspiration 
for this story to be told. And in weaving all the pieces together, I now understand what that message was meant to be. And I now understand why, with all the issues that are converging right now, why this is the time for this particular story to be conveyed. Hopefully it can just strengthen us as a people and strengthen our community, whether you're Kanaka Maoli or not, whether you were born here or you moved here, mm -hmm. having a base or foundation of understanding of what the history of this land is and its people um, is the ultimate goal. Education can only make us better people. And if we can open up a doorway for people to walk in, mm -hmm. that's the major goal of the work that we're doing. Yeah, that is uh, uh, quite um, impressive. You know, I, I know it's, it's an impossible question, but um, not everyone has seen about uh, or heard about the Hawaiians, Hawaiians theater. Um, we know perhaps a little bit more about Japanese one, uh, maybe a bit about Indian. In in a, in a few words, maybe um, um, you could uh, let us know, um, Haile, um, what is it special and what should we look out for? and uh, what, what is the history? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we have a long history of performing. Um, we're performative people. We come from an oral tradition. And so from ritual performance to more secular performance, uh, there has always been this need to express ourselves um, through storytelling. And uh, one of the things that uh, I ended up tackling was research in the newspapers, uh, in the, the, the large archive that we have of about a million pages um, of newspapers that were written and produced from 1834 right into the 1940s. And I jumped into that repository to find, well, what were, what was our production history, right? What was Hanakiaka? And I was able to identify a couple of different types of performance. Um, so we had something called a, a, a tabalo, which were more tableau performances. We also had operas. Um, we had storytelling or ha'i mo'olelo. And um, we had this idea of a nightly entertainment, um, very often written about as kapolea o halali'i. Um, halali'i was a chief uh, who reigned over the island of Kauai and Ni'ihau, and he was a lover of the arts, a true patron of the arts. And so when performances were done in the 1800s and, and advertised or written about in the newspapers, very often we see the headline being Kapolea o Halali'i. Even though Halali'i was from generations before, they tend to pay homage to him with the newer productions that they're doing. What I identified was um, four pillars or kukulu of Hanakiaka. And this is something that is true in the contemporary works we're doing. And this is also characteristics in, in these more traditional forms. So Hanakiaka is, is based on Mo'olelo. Mo'olelo are our narratives, our um, histories and stories. So we'll always find Mo'olelo at the core. We'll also find Ku'oho or our genealogical connections. Um, this is not just between people, but it's with the land, with the environment, um, as well as with our akua or gods. The third then identifying um, pillar is uh, hana no eo. And hana no eo are our visual and performing arts. And finally, we have olelo hawaii. 
Hawaiian language. So these four kukulu um, or pillars are present uh, in the old works uh, that was written about uh, as well as our contemporary works. And we've tried to honor um, Halali'i uh, with some of the work that we're doing. And in having a graduate assistant, I was able to build out a little bit more um, in, in our program. And so in 2020, um, we actually launched a series called Kapolea o Halali'i, which fe featured original works from uh, our students. Now, I want to also mention that in 2020, uh, the great pandemic, we were meant to do an island-wide tour of Aua'ia holding on. Uh, one of our major goals in the work is to get the work into our communities and not to be Oahu centric with everything. And that's coming from a Kauai girl who grew up um, in a rural community that didn't have uh, access to a lot of the things that was happening on our main island on Oahu. Um, so Kapolea o Halali'i then becomes a place for uh, qualifying productions for our, our students. Um, in the 2021-2022 uh, season, we actually had two Hanakeaka. So 2021, as we were all at home and unable to join in theaters um, and experience entertainment as we were used to, Ka'ipulau uh, Makani Olono's uh, Hele Aloha, his thesis production was um, performed on the main stage, but was recorded. And for that, we had a very unique opportunity to call upon our Kanaka Maoli um, filmmaking friends to come in and work with us. So this mm -hmm. production somewhat straddles um, film, the media of film and the media of theater. Mm -hmm. um, that production went up. And then in the spring, um, as bookends, Heleo Aloha, Ho'oilina, Akea Kahikina's Ho'oilina, then also very different. Each of these were quite different and did push um, Hanakeaka and the practice um, into the, into the, you know, new discoveries of different material and different ways of expression. So that year we had uh, another Hanakiaka that um, had audience actually um, for Ho'oilina in the spring. Um, we graduated two more MFAs, uh, Ka'ipu and Akea in 2022. Amazing. So you, you made it through COVID, adapted a very old traditional form to it. Uh, shortly, um, do you train actors specific, specifically dancers for Hawaiian theater? Is that acting training, dancing to happening in your place? Um, who does that? Is that university or is that acting schools outside? Yes. Yeah, so, so our students are coming through the program and taking various types of classes. The Hawaiian uh, acting workshop. Um, or Hawaiian Performance Workshop, now that it'll be called, is something that I teach. Um, I also draw upon uh, my colleagues and uh, in the community, as well as at the university. Uh, so we have um, really well-respected and esteemed kumu uh, or, or masters of different forms who teach with us um, or run workshops uh, for our students to partake in. Um, Probably one of um, my most favorite collaborators is Kumu Keave Lopez, who's the director of Kawai Huelani Center for Hawaiian Language. He and I go way, way back. Um, we were students at the university at the same time. His area of specialization is um, music, composition, uh, singing, as well as um, traditional uh, dance or hula. Um, I might mention that he and his partner, uh, Kumu Tracy Lopez, are the current reigning um, Mary Monarch competition overall winners with their halo 
kala onohimayo hae hae, and they also have um, the current reigning Miss Aloha Hula um, title in their halau. So these are um, just amazing friends mm -hmm. and colleagues who collaborate Beautiful. on these mm -hmm. productions and make up a, a, a quite amazing artistic amazing. team. We're coming closer to the end, but I, if I understood right, you guys also, or you got a very, um, very big award, right? You won a university internally, or is it a national grant? Um, so what is that about? What are you planning? Because we now all see, where is, where is that going? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, so in 2022, a colleague of mine, um, uh, Dr. Lorenzo Perilio and I, we put in a grant, uh, there was a grant proposal um, and a call for submissions in the office of our provost for strategic investment initiatives. And we put in a, a request for to establish a research institute of indigenous performance uh, titled Ahahui Noi Noeo Oivi or Ano. Um, we did receive this grant, and uh, so we've been working since October. It's a very 1st. large one, was right? A, yeah, it was a pretty substantial grant. Um, it uh, you know just under four hundred thousand dollars to Incredible. establish this. Um, Research Institute, which has um, four, I'm sorry, three ma'ave or three um, threads to it. And one ma'ave um, is the scholarship and publication. The second ma'ave is archive and curriculum. And the third ma'ave is recruitment and outreach. And so Ano is working very hard uh, to document the work that has been done, as well as create opportunities for um, scholarship to happen. Um, we're looking at a um, conference that's going to happen in March 2020, 2024. Sorry. Um, and then we are also doing professional development opportunities um, and workshops for our Hawaiian immersion teachers in our Department of Education so that they can learn about Hanakiaka and take that into the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're also developing materials for that and are doing various types of recruitment and outreach across um, our island chain, as well as into Oceania. Um, we are looking for more grant money because it is a 18 month um, grant period. And so we're looking for money to sustain our work. The One of the most beautiful things about ANO is that we wrote into this grant a number of graduate assistantships. So this helps to finance our students' education as they're coming through the program, as well as giving them working hours that they can further um, the community outreach and document the work that's happening, as well as participate in the academic research that's happening and the and mm -hmm. the creative research as well, which Arno supports. Incredible, um, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I would just like to point out um, for our listeners um, how exceptional this is. Do we see this at the University of Texas, at the University of New Mexico? Is this anywhere in the University of Arizona? anywhere in upstate New York? Is there a serious engagement anywhere on a level like, you know, the University of Hawaii you went into? Of course, it has a longer to tradition, but some visionary uh, 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 chancellor said, we need uh, someone like Haile uh, and made it there. Someone like Marcus said, I'll write the proposal for it. I support it. We collaborate. Um, he took that wake up call as a call of, of action. And um, I think it is stunning what you did. It's also a, a place a university can contribute to change. It's so rarely that actually significant initiatives coming out of university that change theater at the moment. 
but um, it is on the same time. It is also uh, 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 unbelievable that this is the only one. It is a, a smaller, uh, a part one thing of a smaller state uh, with was probably less resources as a state like a Texas or uh, so California or others um, or here and uh, um, East Coast. Um, and I think something here um, is really wrong and something needs to be righted. And I think what you guys do is a is a great model, uh, Marcus. Uh, my question to you, how, why do you think is there not happening in other universities, but also how do you see these productions? You are used to go to European productions and, you know, uh, 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 the Richard Foreman's of this world, you know, how, how do you see the uh, aesthetics, uh, the work, the quality of, of Hawaiian theater? So let me just say one, one thing just to add. So we've had the MFA in Hanakeaka since fall 2014. But starting this fall, basically next, next month, we will also have a new PhD track in Hawaiian and indigenous performance. And just to, to link to the, to the beginning of your question, um, I was actually stunned to, to, to realize this past year that there isn't a single department in indigenous performance in entire North America. There are indigenous studies departments, not that many either, uh, but basically no departments in, that focus specifically on, on indigeneity and performance. So this will be kind of the first uh, PhD program kind of graduate track with, with, that, with that particular focus. Um, and it will so open next fall? Th this, this fall. This, this fall. fall. How many students? We have two coming. <laughs> two coming. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we're just starting this. Starting, and of course, it's, and of course, it's incredible. Yes. Where it still, still needs to, 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 to get around. Um, and as far as the style is concerned, I've been very surprised by the diversity of styles um, that the different productions that Heidi just kind of talked about kind of represent. Like, for example, the beginning of Hui Lina, which was really a contemporary comedy, mostly in Oledo, Hawaii, but also in Pidgin English and some, and some in English, um, um, was but basically about a um, group of kind of adopted Hawaiian now adults. Um, the matriarch has kind of passed away, and now it's all about who will, how will the, the uh, inheritance be split, and an unknown relative, relative seemingly very white, from the continent kind of arrives. So there's this kind of farcical comedic elements, and what was brilliant about this production was that the different characters, also based on the political affiliations, spoke varying degrees of let's say olelo hawaii versus english so of course you know the 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 activist hawaiian character exclusively spoke hawaiian and a, a character perhaps you know less in tune with that movement spoke english so there was this kind of the various political positions were also reflected in the language choices the characters made but what was really stunning to me was the beginning of the show where one actor who also appears in the show appeared in drag but in the costume and how do you may correct me <laughs> of i think kamehameha the third but with glitter i mean i mean there, there was an engagement with hawaiian tradition that seemed risky on one hand um, but I could absolutely tell that the Hawaiian audience members around me actually really loved it and appreciated it because it still respected tradition at the same time. But, but I have to say, I had never seen anything like that in, you know, in theater. I mean, since, since uh, moving to Oahu in, in you know, 20, 22 years ago. So there's a, there's a, there's a broad range. And you have a, a Kabuki production upcoming. Is that then a... A traditional kabuki, or do you have a Hawaiian take on it? Or um, it's also a big production, I, I, I guess. So, the, so the upcoming kabuki production that we will uh, see next next April is, is really unrelated from the Hanakiaka program. That is really um, 
uh, produced by our Japanese uh, theater professor, Juliet C, who has really been yeah. working on this for four years, fundraising, being in touch with master artists, master makeup artists, uh, costumers, etc. So th this is a f fully realized Kabuki production in authentic costumes with an authentic set master teachers will provide movement and voice classes this fall um and i think at the beginning of of uh, of, of spring so that that is that that is part mm -hmm. of this kind of you know 60 year tradition at our department uh that is also at the same time continuing who knows and one day maybe that closeness to japan that hawaii that islands that archipelago of islands in the middle between these continents you know maybe who knows where your students might find a fusion as they did um, as you said, you know, if I know the right thing, elements of a drag performance and a Hawaiian king and a, and a, a comedy. So who knows um, um, what forms uh, will come out? This is just the start. And who knows how in 20, 40, 50, 100 years, um, um, what will bloom um, out of a change that was uh, uh, created, you know, um, from a call from activists and from from. Um, Legend leaders, visionary leaders of the university, but also the right people uh, who happen to be there in in the right uh, in the right moment. I'm so impressed uh, um, with all of it. You know, I hope uh, we have talked about it, and I think we might uh, also realize that it will create maybe a, a, a journal, an academic journal. Um, we have the uh, Opalan Nieted uh, Ryan Pierce here at the Graduate Center CUNY. Uh, also a great leader um, of uh, artists, Native and American or indigenous artists here in New York from the Lenape um, and tradition. I think everyone here can only dream of such resources, such support. Um, but worldwide, globally, there is so much uh, work being done, which we are not aware of, whether it might be in Siberia or on, uh, in, uh, in Mongolia, in uh, Indonesia or um, anywhere um, in uh, the African uh, a continent um, that it qualifies over there. So I'm thrilled to hear that you established a PhD program for that. And it is uh, also of importance because if we have learned anything also in the time of Corona is that we have to listen to indigenous voices. We have to listen to a way of connecting to life, the meaning of life, of honoring life, of uh, animals, plants, uh, traditions, rituals that go back because uh, what is going uh, wrong at the moment is connected uh, to the fact that we have lost um, that connection the fact that 1500 flights got canceled last night storms unseen uh, here in the Hudson the heat waves in Texas the the wildfires in Canada extreme heat uh, also in Europe I think it is all uh, is something where we haven't paid attention and I think not only we have to look at it because it's an interesting form of theater and we should include it. And there are so many arguments. For it. But I think there's also wisdom, there's a tradition, and there's also knowledge embedded that is there perhaps to help us to find something and to connect or to have better lives. Um, Haili, how do you see that? Is that um, on your agenda? Um, or um, do you think you, you're focusing on theater as theater as an art in itself? I would agree. I would agree that um, we are connecting to something that's greater than than us. Um, we are, you know, through art, um, through the retelling of these stories, uh, we we connect with those who came before us and allow them to guide us into the future. So, yeah, it it is something that many many indigenous peoples are tapping into now. I think that, you know, looking at our ritual performance and looking at our languages and looking at traditional practice um, and cultural values and allowing that um, to really steer the canoe as we move forward and navigate forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a time where just interhuman conflicts take space and place on the stage, uh, you know, perhaps uh, it is not what is most needed. It's also needed, but not most needed. We need to find ways to live with nature, with plants, with animals, um, with everything that's around us, with the forces. And we are nature. We are part of it. We had a great talk with philosopher Andreas Weber here. And I'm saying he would be very interested, you know, to know um, what uh, you are all doing, that critical zone, as Bruno Latour always said, 
uh, 30 feet above us, 30 feet below us. We are just part of that. We are not the main actors, as he said, the, the, the princes, the directors. Of, we are part of an entire environment. And I think we have to learn that. And I think uh, theater, indigenous theater, and um, from that, what is left and what we have to find again, again and revive, uh, there is something in there that is of real importance for all of us. Also, as you mentioned, th things happen outside uh, um, um, the, 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 the enclosed spaces. And so there is, I think, also something um, to discover and to learn and also for you and the journey which you have um, just started. But I have to say, I'm so very, very impressed. It's such a great model and congratulations um, to the U University um, of Hawaii, Manoa, um, that uh, they made that um, possible. And, um, and maybe both of you talk a little bit about upcoming projects, your research and the next plays, or uh, what, what are you doing in your life? And then we will say goodbye. Marcus. Oops, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm still the department chair and I'm kind of looking forward to uh, finish my this current term. I have two more years. Um, so in terms of upcoming projects, uh, this is actually not related to Hana Kiaka, but we also have a really impressive dance program. And for the, se the second time, I will actually be the dramaturg on a, on a dance con concert uh, created and directed by our very talented choreographer and dancer, Peiling Kao. She is uh, one of our colleagues in the, in the dance faculty. And this is a production that will happen in November. And she uh, collaborates with, I think, at least three trans transgender um, former grads, uh, current collaborators, as well as actually uh, a number of indigenous collaborators from the continent. So that so that's also something that we do. We didn't really get to talk about this. So that's also a very strong uh, dance aspect. And apart from that, I'm right now um, <laughs> completing the uh, proofs of the next Brecht yearbook, which has kind of more than 408 pages that I need to send to mm -hmm. the publisher in 10 days. <laughs> What's the Brecht, the theme or of the Brecht there, yearbook? There, there's no theme at this point. We uh, gave that up a few years ago. A few years ago, mm -hmm. the Brecht yearbook still had an annual kind of motto, but but usually these days, the um, the contributions are so so diverse. They're really kind of uh, not that easy to, you know, put under one kind of thematic umbrella. Yeah, and it was very influential, Brecht, and the Asian Theatre Conference you you created. Um, Haili, what's up on your plate? Yes, so we have the launching of the PhD in Hawaiian and Indigenous Performance, as well as two Hanakiaka productions happening in this academic year, or the 2023-2024 the season. Um, in September, we have Kaisara, which is an adaptation of... Um, Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar, framed within the political context of 1894. That's a student production. Of the Hawaiian uh, situation in 1984, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The end of uh, the monarchy. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so this is about a year after the overthrow. And so some really important political players who are also the major scholars in our newspapers um, come to read a translation, which actually appeared in the newspaper. It's a few scenes from Julius Caesar that were translated into Olelo Hawaii in the 1890s. Uh, so that opens up in September. And then in February, um, which is Hawaiian Language Month, we have Glitter in the Pa'akai happening. Um, and then in March, we have our inaugural conference for Ano. That will be followed by um, the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists uh, Confest happening in May. And then June, we have the Festival of Pacific Arts, where 26 island nations will be convening in Hawaii uh, to share their various types of art. This is what we consider the Olympics of Pacific art. Uh, it, it will bring in many, many different people. Um, and it, it's a great celebration, a really great celebration. So we hope to have some of our work featured in that. And then fall 2024, we'll have our next Hanakiaka production on the main stage, followed by our Huakaipai Aina 
or neighbor island tour of that. And in all of this, we're just looking for um, funding. So we're grant writing furiously so that we can sustain ANO, our research institute, and all of the work we're doing. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, it's really about giving our students opportunities uh, through um, grants and graduate assistantships uh, and, you know, telling our stories yeah, and creating and raising, opportunities. Yeah, raising awareness, you know, for that significant yes. field yes. of art, culture, uh, theater and uh, study. And um, it really is amazing. It seems to be the place where things are happening. We all should know more about people should get on the airplanes and come to the festivals and see the plays and participate um, and um, and to um, and to be in exchange and to experience that uh, also a very beautiful uh, place in the world. Also, your campus is so uh, inspiring. I think the different architectures for mixing from around and the and the space in between. So it is quite a quite a unique um, a unique place. So thank you, thank you both um, really for um, uh, uh, being with us um, and for sharing your experience. It's truly an inspiring story, also a story that is not. Uh, marked by bitterness or by uh, defeat, not on, but it's for, it's for a joyful one and hopeful one. So, um, and it can and should serve as a novel that things actually are possible. So, um, thank you both. And I know, Marcus, you could have said so much more, and uh, Ely and students and other participants, but we already went very much over time. We'd like to thank HowlRound. Um, for this and I hope you all will join us back we will try to have maybe over the summer conversations with people who do run festivals around the world to see what is happening but this was a great update on um, theater in the United States uh, on the island and the archipelagos um, of, um, of Hawaii thank you both bye bye and thanks to Mahalo. BJ and thank you Aloha. thank you Frank Mahalo. Mahalo. bye 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 thank you <laughs>